Oh, good morning, folks. Uh, beautiful, sunshiny day for February 6th. Uh, this is uh, the Agricultural Committee. And um, this morning, we had the honor of having Doug Farnham with us, uh, Chief uh, Flood Recovery Individual, works for the Agency of Administration. And so, Doug, uh, you can drive us quickly here. Um, the, uh, we've got the uh, person coming in behind you uh, that uh, actually does the current use program now that you used uh, years back. I think you handled that. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Jill, Jill Renrick. And um, but uh, we wanted to uh, have you in and and talk a little bit about the uh, blood issue and and uh, dealing with the farmland and cropland and and all that uh, just to give us uh, an overview of how that's working out and and uh, go from there and we'll. Uh, Introduce ourselves and then jump right in for it. Ryan Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Good to see you, though. Irene Renner, Chip Ben Rutland, good to hear thanks. Brian Campion, Bankton County, good to see you. I'm Rich Wesson, good to see you. And Bobby Starr from Orleans County. So, good morning and welcome. Welcome to the Ag Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Doug Sparta, Chief Recovery Officer. Um, one, uh, you know, we're never satisfied with with one or two hats in the, in the state government. We're a small but fierce organization, right? So I'm the flood recovery. I also am still overseeing the pandemic recovery efforts and the, the spending of the Arthur State Fiscal Recovery Fund. So for reference, um, any inquiries into how those programs are going. If you don't know uh, the right person to connect with, I'm a good central point of contact for anything. Arthur State Fiscal, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act. If it's new one-time federal funds, um, you can check with me and I can at least find the right person for you to talk to, even if I, if I don't know the answer. Um, I generally stay at a higher level and then if it's, if it's really programmatic, we'll have to do a referral, but some questions I can answer myself. And yes, um, every once in a while you feel good about something that you accomplished in state government and hiring Jill Remick years ago to be my assistant director, I think uh, was a really nice benefit to the state because she's done a great job as a director of PBR after I uh, transitioned into other roles. So it's nice to see a steady can on the, on the rubber there. Um, one reason I mentioned the ARPA, I did share uh, a current status update of the Arpa State Fiscal Recovery for the, uh, just for the committee's reference, in case you end up having any questions about where we are in progress. For, for Arpa, I would say um, most of that portfolio does not directly impact agriculture, um, but there are some strong indirect impacts on, on the agriculture industry in that, in that spending portfolio. The biggest things I would say are uh, related to the water investment section uh, because an issue I continually have uh, relayed to me in many contexts is just workforce housing and agricultural workforce housing is you know equally challenged and in many cases to to build that housing our our older water systems we either we have a community considering a water system or upgrading the water system so um, over the last um, couple of years, I've really found that those investments in water systems are, are kind of foundational to, um, to growing our housing stock and maintaining our current housing stock in an environmentally friendly way. Because uh, obviously, if we were a different state than we are, we could slap housing up and not care about what happens with the, with the consequences. But that's not the state we live in, right? So uh, we do have... Uh, still over $100 million flowing through our water programs. And over the next uh, 24 already, yeah. Over the next three years, uh, we will be 
seeing a lot of those water improvements go active, and that will help facilitate um, the housing investments that we need to make as well. So that's that, the main part of it. ARPA money is good for three more years until it's all removed. Just under three years. So 12 31 2026, when we have to have it spent by. We have to have it. Um, oh, shoot. Log on me. We have to have it obligated by the end of this year. So by December 31st of this year. Uh, however, we are making really positive strides on getting those obligations made. And one thing that we included in the reports, and this is on the third slide uh, in, the, in the information I shared, is there's an awarded status now that we're tracking where we've formally committed to a project. We've sent someone an award letter saying, yes, we're, gonna, we're going to fund that project, but we haven't crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's to meet the federal definition of a full formal obligation. And that's why there was a gap on our previous reports. So like making it look like more money was undirected than it really was. Um, $170 million in that award in staff. Doug, I'm just wondering, does most of that money flow through ANR or is there some in the Agency of Agriculture as well? Do you know? So, Senator, the Agency of Agriculture's uh, ARPA investments were relatively modest. They were in the Working Lands programs. Uh, there was $6 million that was transferred over through the Clean Water Board process. Um, that is directed towards agricultural best practices. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely been um, some benefit. So I apologies if I get a little blase about the numbers. It's I think it's roughly $11 million of ARPA out of the billion dollar portfolio. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, as a state, we didn't we didn't direct the ARPA funds toward the agriculture industry as a as a major sector. Uh, but we yes, there was eleven million dollars of ARPA that that uh, is primarily flowing through the Agency of Agriculture and it has been helping farmers adjust to best practices and climate resilience. And what about the Agency of Natural Resources? So Agency of Natural Resources is where uh, the vast majority of that water money uh, is flowing through and most of it having to do with, um, you know, there was a tiered system of, you know, a smaller program that's designed to help with um, designed to help with villages that are just looking to get a water system or like right on that edge of needing a water system. Um, and then other programs that are helping people upgrade or fix the combined sewer overflow, trying to help those larger municipalities generally are the ones that, mm -hmm. that need to utilize that program. And then um, one of the interesting programs that was launched during the pandemic that we, to my knowledge, didn't have in Vermont before was the Healthy Homes Initiative. And that does a lot of, uh, wastewater system replacement for uh, manufactured home communities, low-income home, home communities. It really, we're finding a lot more um, opportunity in that area than we had than we had thought. The program quickly became oversubscribed and was kind of plus up. So is, go ahead, you can, um, if one had a village that was having water issues, I have a village that, um, um, had leaky pipes, they, uh, and they've had water issues, and they tried to um, build some supplemental water capacity this past year. It didn't, um, and they put a moratorium on any development within the village. Uh, is there any money left for them to apply, like over the summer? Um. I think at this point, there's a possibility that they would, but most of the programs have pulled in their applications and have made awards at this point. Um, so I'd say that a lot of the a lot of the opportunity there has narrowed for ARPA specifically. However, the bipartisan infrastructure law really augmented the, and actually in in just as significant or more significant way than than ARPA did, our water programs, and we should see increased opportunity for, for those kind of village water system repairs over the next several years. That Those bipartisan structural law programs are gonna run for another three to four years and then have a you know four-year tail on many well, of them. In this particular case, they have fixed the leaks that they had. The agency has now said to them, um, and, and they went out and they drilled over the summer, apparently, 
to try to give themselves more capacity, they hit nothing. Mm. So they're in the process of reevaluating and thinking because they need some more capacity. It's a village of about five, six hundred people. Okay. And they um um and they're now scrambling to figure out what they can do. They thought last year by drilling they would get extra capacity. They didn't. So they're stuck and was just wondering what who they might talk to. If they're a village of five or six hundred people, odds are um, they'd be eligible for the municipal technical assistance program. Yeah. And and that's where they should be able to get additional assistance with planning and, and problem solving and um, project management. Um, so I would definitely recommend and uh, that program I'm still overseeing as well. Okay. Um, so can you give me contact information? Yes. I'll send it to so does does that program also take in uh waste water treatment facilities or just drinking water coming in? So the, the municipal technical assistance program, Mr. Chair? No, I mean the efforts. Oh um yes, the 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 slated programs we have running right now does address all of the different, you know, tiers of a of drinking water system, a wastewater system, and the, the bipartisan infrastructure law funding was broad as well. So it kind of raised the level of funding in, in all of our programs pretty yeah. significantly. Because I know, like, um, Rotland has got miles of old, yep. old, old pipe in. So I right? wouldn't. And I would expect wow. Burlington probably isn't any better. Matter of fact, I think I heard you on the way down, they're starting a big project this morning to redo some piping and upgrades. Uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know if Rutland's in on that or not. I don't know either. I know the federal push for... Uh, to speed up the replacement of lead pipes. I mean, that certainly has the opportunity to benefit Vermont. I'm mostly a lay person in that one. That, that's about as much as I know about how it interacts with our programs. I just know they're they're pushing, but you know, they've also been saying they're pushing for the last 20 years in Michigan to replace the pipes. And that still has an option. So I should think it uh, healthy dose of skepticism. If Broughton would dig out those wooden pipes, they could probably sell them to to Michigan museum or something. Right. I never, you know, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, amazing. We we dug some out at home. We did. Or they hollowed out for a while. Wow. Yeah. Year. I mean, ten. Yeah. Fifteen years. It's still pretty yeah. cool. Well, that's but yeah, the village that I'm talking about. These are all pipes that were put in in the twenties. Well, they wouldn't have logs. No, they didn't have logs, but I mean, you know, it's the same issue. Right? You know, yeah. it, we have a lot of villages that did stuff a hundred years ago in Holland. Yeah. I would say one one kind of note I've made myself on where our money was directed with ARPA and where some of our programs just tend to exist at the state and federal level is that the, the largest gap for us is in those smaller communities where it's so much harder to start that system or to maintain a small system. Yeah. Many of the federal programs, they're in our state programs as well, they run off a calculation of return on investment and economy of scale um, that uh, is, is a very difficult bar for many smaller communities to meet. So I, I would say that's not necessarily uh, something that's easily within our control or the control of the General Assembly, right? It's just uh, an unfortunate dynamic in the way our governments work right now. But everyone wants to be able to answer the question of, did you spend government money efficiently? They want to be able to say yes. Sure. And that leads <laughs> to uh, a disadvantage for smaller communities, quite naturally. Well, I... I'd hate to be the audit auditor that audited some of the federal programs to see if it was spent efficiently. 
if such is held to the power. That but so mr chair um i would like i said the arpa effort has some indirect um impact on agriculture and the main impact it would have is that as part of the governor's recommended budget we propose an arpa contingency process where because we have to have those funds obligated uh, before the end of the year for programs that have run their course, which some of them have truly run their course as they were designed by the legislature, um, or if it appears that they are not going to be able to reasonably expend or safely expend their funds within the 2026 timeframe, that after September 30th, we would revert those funds, uh, we being in this case, uh, finance and management, and reappropriate them to what to pre approved use by the legislature of uh, 90% going to FEMA match and hazard mitigation, and then 10% being retained for um, administrative costs and audit defense. With the spike in um, federal money flowing through with the spike in new program creation, we've seen a spike in the audits done by the state auditor, and, and some of those are very deep, involving more than 100 questions. and. Um, it just is difficult to pay staff to to answer all those questions and, and all that scrutiny. Um, so the 36 million though, I think has a, a massively strong overlap with uh, agriculture. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about today. So we have roughly, and um, the other document I shared focusing on more of the flood and the impact of the flood, talks about the direct you know, damages, the direct financial impacts of the flood. And altogether, we think that this will be a, uh, well, right, right now, actually, the current estimated damage is just over 600 million with FEMA. And that is only state and municipal damage, not federal highway damage, which was 150 million as well, but this, the, the portions that are eligible for the FEMA public assistance program. It doesn't count individual damage. It doesn't count business or agricultural damage, which I know agriculture is estimated about a $70 million um, damage right now. Um, but the reason that $600 million number is, is important is that FEMA gives us 15% of whatever that number ends up being for hazard mitigation. And that can cover buyouts, elevations, and floodplain restoration work, um, general uh, hazard reduction work. One thing that we have that we didn't have after Irene is that there's a SWIFT current program, FEMA calls it. We got a separate pot of money to do buyouts and elevations. After, after Irene, we had to use over a third of our hazard mitigation money to support buyouts. And in this, we're trying to utilize, in this event, we're trying to use that SWIFT current appropriation for as much buyout and elevation as possible so the hazard mitigation funding can go towards the floodplain restoration and the other risk reduction activities. Um, now, approached a certain way, flood floodplain mitigation and hazard reduction can be antagonistic to agriculture. If you if you approach it with the mindset of, well, we're just gonna you know drop this down, we're gonna conserve the land, nothing can be done on the land. It's now store purely storage for the water, and I've been involved in the discussions. I will be involved in the regional discussions around what we're taking on for hazard mitigation projects. I think we need to be, we need to be creative about, you know, living with our agricultural landscape, reducing the risk to our agricultural industry wherever possible. And in some trying to find those situations that could be more of a win-win situation where we could be reducing flood risk um, and still utilizing the um, land for agricultural purposes. I think it's it gets tricky, right? Because we had some uh, crop losses. Well, do you buy, must be they buy uh, flood plain land uh, from individuals so that if the water goes above a certain level, it runs out onto this land that the state has purchased. Uh, so that it doesn't 
applying the home service to the neighbor. Is that is that what you're talking about? I mean, the most or is build maintenance. Mr. That's Chair, the most you know, the most traditional version, right, is for the state to buy the land, for the land to be fully conserved, yeah, right, for fill to be taken out so that more water can spread out in that area. Um, and some areas uh, upstream of Middlebury, wetlands restoration, um, were very successful in this flooding event. Stored massive amounts of water, prevented it from doing more damage to Middlebury. Uh, Brownville, a lot of the projects that we've done since I, uh, Tropical Storm Irene showed their value in the summer uh, floods. Um, and yes, that state purchase, that conservation is is the most traditional model of it. I think that will still certainly happen where it's appropriate and where everyone agrees. I think the trickiest part with hazard mitigation is getting the individual owners in line and, and agreeing with the community about what needs to happen. Um, I would say the inter administration is not interested in ignoring people's property rights. And, and we really wanna find solutions that that everyone can get on board with. Uh, the other way to approach this, and one reason when we asked for that contingency money, we asked for FEMA match and hazard mitigation, not specifically just hazard mitigation match, but the ability to use those funds for match for FEMA, but also to find creative solutions where if, if we need to make sure that um, if there's a situation where a farmer can theoretically continue using that land, producing agriculturally when, when there is no flooding um, and they could be compensated for the water storage that they're taking on, um, I think that could be a win-win. It could help insulate some of the farmers against the economic harm of flooding. So I think that's the, the lane we need to explore is more creative agreements, more creative approaches to balancing uh, continuing to use the land for agriculture and um, not just, you know, drawing on a map that, well, these look like great floodplains. Let's, you know, buy it from the farmers and drop the land and move on. Um, yeah, the, <clears throat> so I know the rip, what they call the river road at home, they, you know, years back, they, we had some money set up and they bought a whole farm and tore the buildings down. And, and I'll tell you now, when, like when we have the big rains, it's all flooded. They're gonna have to build the road up higher because the road even floods today. But that that area helped save flooding down in North Troy Village and in Highwater yeah. and Duncan. And, yeah. So who's doing the assessment for that? Now? Uh, in my area, most of the floodplain now is uh, that's farmland, and most of it is farmland. Most of it has the development rights gone, mm -hmm. and um, um, and, and it's in the floodplain in the community, and um, they're discouraging development there. So, what are you proposing to buy? So. Yeah, the way we're approaching that, Senator, is that, um, well, we had one fortunate element of timing recently where last year I was involved in an effort to update our LIDAR data with some, there was the technology around LIDAR, um, and uh, I wish I could actually say what LIDAR stands for, but... Um, <laughs> I was just going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> I know that it is, it's a process where they do, they fly over and they have pretty advanced technology to really read elevation levels, right? So they created a digital map of the state. We hadn't, we had collected that over the course of 2023, but we hadn't put it through a full suite of hydrological analysis yet. So that's what we're doing right now. And we're working with some partners, um, some external partners to help us with that analysis because, uh, with all the other work we're doing, it's a tough. It's a little bit tough to do all of that. But what we're our hope is, is we're going to have that analysis done. That that river corridor, watershed basin, all of the levels of elevation level that will identify areas where the water's going, where we have opportunities for mitigation, 
Um, so we'll identify those parcels that um, we want to focus on as far as potential projects. We're lining up. So we have to sprint right now to, to utilize the SWIFT current program because the deadline for those buyouts and elevations applications is in April. Then in July, we have to send a list of our hazard mitigation projects to FEMA. And that, so we need to identify those hazard mitigation, those floodplain projects before July. And the way we're approaching that is the regional recovery officers, um, Pat Moulton, Central Vermont, and Todd Eaton, and Holly Hayden have been uh, redirected from agency of transportation to help me in that role. They're going to be organizing regional conversations um, this spring that will help us generate that list of $100 million of hazard mitigation projects. So that's how we're trying to come up with the exact you know, what parcels, what pieces of land can we work with? Um, I think the, the thing we struggle with, right, is that we can identify an opportunity for mitigation, but if the, if the owner's not on board, it can, it can kill the entire project. So what we'll have to do is, you know, we'll develop this, we'll have multiple town regional sessions and discussions about the projects. Because often a project in one town doesn't benefit that town, it benefits the next town, three towns, down. three towns down and the next town. And so we need to get those community groups, those regional support, <clears throat> and see if they can convince some of those landowners that it's in the best interest of that region to, to, to um, go along with the plan. And also come up with creative ways to try to make it worth, you know, the, worth that landowner's time um, and, and property, right? Read for the Mr. Um, I keep hearing the word FEMA. I have a county that was not designated disaster area, so I have people who are stuck, not getting a penny from FEMA. Mm -hmm. Will you be going to those areas, and can you spend money there buying out and mitigating, or are we stuck with just the designated FEMA areas, and will my town, that got flooded as well, because it's downward work from everything else that flooded, um, once again be left high drive? And out money themselves out of their pocket. Right. So the the hazard mitigation projects that is a statewide approach. There's no limitation to spend the, those monies on declared counties. Um, and yes, I mean some of the towns in Addison, which did not get declared for individual assistance, actually had the most rain, had the most water, and had very um, concentrated pockets of damage, which didn't hit FEMA's calculations. I would say that for individual assistance. Um, I've been pushing this for a while. The, there has been limited progress here, but the Vermont Disaster Recovery Fund is intended to be the path to help people if they have exhausted all their other options. And unfortunately, if you don't get FEMA assistance or SBA, Small Business Administration assistance, your options are exhausted very, very quickly. Um, so we're still um, staying connected with the VDRF and, and encouraging them strongly to you know, um, have, a, have a process for those counties, those individuals that weren't eligible for FEMA assistance so we can give them some support. And I think they do grants of up to 25,000, which is helpful, but in some cases people lost two, three hundred thousand dollars or more. And Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. So, um, Doug, you mentioned in the, the uh, I don't know if it's a white paper or just this presentation, that in terms of the SWIFT current program, 90 million, because it's a FEMA match situation, correct? So there's 50 million, I think, in state matching funds, and then 10 million in municipal match. And I realize that's spread out over the whole state. So one community is not going to be facing a $10 million match. How do they, how does a local community match it with an issuance of a bond or how, how do they pay that? Generally speaking, Senator, um, and that $10 million. Because, well, at least under the governor's recommended construct, the state would take on the burden of all of the hazard mitigation match. Okay. So that the towns didn't have to contribute any. So that 10 million is exclusively limited to damage and repair and direct mitigation from the storm, like upsizing culverts or putting in a larger bridge with, you know, a more modern configuration that can stand up to the stand up to the weather. Um, we do sometimes see like in Cabot, for instance, they massively upsized some culverts. Uh, they still failed due to the debris coming down the mountain, and mm -hmm. that same section of their downtown was still blasted, just carved out. Um, so I think that that 10 million, and I know um, 
there have been conversations around. So right now that 10 million is the town's paying 5% of the total damages. Okay. So we're assuming that this disaster is going to go to a 90%, 10% cost share between FEMA and state and local uh, because their trigger is 111 million and we've got 600 million that we know exists, right? Uh, there is the potential because that 50 50 cost share is set through the emergency relief assistance fund rule of relieving some of the additional burden uh, from municipalities for that match. <laughs> Um, and I think, uh, the main reason we didn't put that forward in, in the governor's recommended budget is that even to secure all the funding for hazard mitigation, uh, that was a, a difficult balancing act. Um, so we prioritized investing fully in the mitigation efforts to try to make sure that, uh, the next time we get this much water, there's less damage. If we hadn't had Irene and been um, prompted to take on so much mitigation work, um, this event would have been much more significantly worse. <clears throat> well, plus they dug, they dug in the river and made that the channels wider and, and uh, deeper. So the water down through, uh, is that from that hole over across to 100? Yeah. Yeah, you right. know, they cleaned that river out so the damn water would stay in the river and not clean everything out in its path. Is that, are you saying uh, after Irene they did that? Yeah. No, during Irene. During Irene, as it was, got it. Well, I'd say, because, you know, you could hire a contractor to go in and do work. Yeah. And, and you know, got rich. I'm, so... A lot of the work that you're talking about in the flood relief reform, trying to get rid of it, go yes. So most, because most of the flood plain down through the wild, and down through um, Johnson, Cambridge, Fairfax, all the way down through, most of the farmland, um, the development rights have been purchased by the state. It's going to remain undeveloped farmland. Mm -hmm. The conservation districts have been the most successful at dealing with my farmers and putting up riparian buffers and all of that stuff. And we've had trouble funding and getting money out there for um, the conservation district. Is any of that hundred million, um, would it be available for the conservation districts and some of the work that they do? Uh, Senator, possibly some of the work that they're doing, I would think, yes. Um, but it would have to, FEMA's um, relatively rigid in that we have to frame it up as specific projects. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we have to present a list of those projects by the end of this calendar year. Um, because so the actual I, I, I would just, I would just say <laughs> they've been the most successful at dealing with farmers doing riparian buffers and doing all of it, that sort of work. And uh, I would think that the people that already have relationship would be the best people to work with the farmers to do stuff. Right. Well, and I think uh, for the example of a large agricultural parcel that is already, the development rights are, is already conserved. There's not gonna be any development there. Uh, right, but depending on how the farmer is using that land, if it could be lowered so that there could be more storage there for floodplain storage, but the farmer could be compensated for the additional risk that's going to place on them and the additional potential for crop loss, then that could be an approach in some spaces. I do think we're going to, when we look at the river corridors and our, and our watersheds, we are going to see areas where there is no, there is no easy answer, right? Uh, where we're not able to mitigate the risks. And I think that'll be, a big part of the discussion this this spring and summer is what do we do when we run into those situations where, okay, well, we know Johnson has a really high risk of flooding, but we don't see any upriver opportunities. Um, so how do we how do we go about creating those opportunities without and while respecting people's yeah. rights? Well, yeah, I I would just say. You can and, take Lampier's cornfield out above Johnson. Yeah. 
dig that down 20 feet. Well, I, 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 I get that. Run in there, but, but you're, you're going to lose that but what, for good growing. Tree. Yeah, but what you, what you talk about in that is a lot of the problem below Johnson is that some of, um, until they started putting riparian buffers and doing all that, you've had runoff that has created gravel that is ended up in the middle of the river downstream and you can't go get it. So my my thinking is if I've got conservation districts that have already had relationships with these farmers, if I could get it so I didn't get the runoff that created any getting any more get in the river. Yeah. I, I the problem is let's keep that that gravel and stuff out of the river because once it gets in there, they won't let us do anything. Well, it, see, Doug, uh, common sense doesn't have, there's no room for that. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, you can, you could go out and buy um, the field that I just mentioned. Yep. You could dig, you can go in there and dig that, that sort of growing turf out of there, say 20 feet deep, and do whatever you want with it. But if you dug the river 10 feet out of the river, which you can't do because of something, um, you know, you'd have good usable gravel that could be used on back roads and to build them up, but for some reason, we have laws, I guess, that you can't. The only time you can dig in a river is right after the flood when the governor declares an emergency, you have about 30 days. To, you can go in there and play in the water and have a dry going dig. But, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to waste good growing ground to catch water in and let the rivers fill up with with gravel from upstream that basically um, lets the water run shallower. So it gets warmer. You know, shallow water will warm up from the sun in the summer. So then it gets to the lake. And then the algae boom takes off in the lake because the lake temperatures come up. I mean, it, it just makes no sense to me why we don't keep the water where it's supposed to be in the river. So, uh, when I was young and, and uh, growing up, you know, small, uh, the town always used to have a guy with Marshall George was the contractor, had a big drag one. And he would take the sand and the gravel out of the, that built up in the rivers. The town would take it and put it, you know, stockpile it, let it dry out some. And then they'd use it on their town roads and on the, on the farm. I mean, you know, we had five miles of farmland. And I mean, we did uh, ditching my dad and, and uh, my uncle, uh, my dad and his dad would have ditching done every year on different plots of that land to keep even the runoff from the fields to stay in the ditches rather than running out into the, the hay fields or corn fields. And, I don't know why we don't do that anymore. Somebody a lot way too smart figured that out. Well, let's say, Mr. Chair, that I, you know, I have had conversations with A&R about, you know, why they don't recommend dredging, why it's only used in certain locations. Um, and I think, you know, I think one of the goals of the regional discussions and the outreach this spring and summer will be to talk through and really for them to show their show their math and show their modeling and kind of um, prove their case on uh, on why it's not the right solution, right? I do think it's um, 
I hope you're in the meeting and question. Yes. I think that, you know, we, we, we can't afford to just apply one lens to this. It's too complex of a problem, right? So we do need to not just have an environmental lens and not just have an industrial lens. We do need to um, try to balance our, our approaches to hazard mitigation. I do think, you know, there'll be, if you have a stretch of river where, you know, for 50 miles, it's just all agricultural land around it, you know, your, your options there are going to be limited. Um, so I do know that for every community we're, that we're going to go talk to, I know that dredging and why don't we take material out of the river it is going to be a topic at every single one of those conversations. Well, especially if you get anybody there that's over 30 years old. I mean, you let the kids run the show and they don't know what dredging even is. Uh, you know, other than what they've read in books. Uh, you get some of those old guys that ran the town for, you know, for 25, 30 years, 30 years ago, they'd show up. Uh, but I know, you know, I can still remember, you know, hell, 70 odd years ago, I told my dad when they were doing that. And, uh, and we had some flooding back then, but nothing like what we've experienced here in the last 20 years. Right. Uh, so you could probably answer this, I think, Doug. If there's got to be an intersection with federal law and state law, too, in terms of the ability to do what the chair is suggesting. Isn't it a rule that if, if that body of water empties into something else and empties into the ocean, that it becomes a federal situation, or, or am I way off base there? Um, you may be right, Senator, but in my discussions with FEMA and with HC Natural Resources, talking about you know, what we can and can't do, um, a and R really has the ability to regulate the river corridors in Vermont and to, to do most things within those river corridors. Um, Lake Champlain, I think you're right about the aspect because the EPA, because of Lake Champlain's position, um, the EPA has more control over Lake Champlain and that's where we saw the thin water problem where we had findings from that, et cetera. But most of our river work, we, we have less risk of that with what, what it came down to shortly after the disaster and debris removal from the river, it, which I think we're still navigating. Actually, just on Friday, there were some more dumpsters and things pulled out of the river. Uh, and um, there's still a massive amount of debris in the river that needs to be uh, addressed. <laughs> FEMA will only pay for debris removal if it's endangering an existing structure. So if you have a debris pile up that looks like it's about to take out a bridge or something like that, if it's just sitting in the river, taking up space that water should be in and looking hideous, they're not going to pay for that. Um, Up in Wilcock, it was uh, stuff all along the river there, well, dumpsters and trees all there. Wilcox? Yeah. Yeah, they, they had a good dumping ground up yeah. there. We just came yeah. down from other... Yeah, from up above. And uh, there was a pile of them Yeah, yeah theoretical, the, the Route 15 all down through here. So. Yeah. I've always been of the opinion that we did some of our best work, and Governor Shumlin was in charge at the time, right after Irene, that you you got guys, and, and all the regulations and all that stuff was just gone, and you went and saw people just in the rivers pulling stuff out and uh, repairing roads, and it was done quickly and efficiently and expertly. The sections of Route 4, which were gone, literally, they were just gone. Are, well, they were back within a few weeks to a month, maybe, and they're still there. And everything worked out. So I think it's a testament to that we can do a lot of stuff if you remove the restrictions when you need to. I'm not saying we need to, to do that every Saturday or Sunday, but um, it, it was really amazing to watch that happen. Do you know if the restrict were the restrictions made removed because it was federal 
disaster, labeled as a federal disaster or something. Because I know the governor called it right. a, a, a state national, disaster. Right. Yeah. And then because I know the uh, Army Corps of Engineers came in, mm -hmm. they did a lot of work, I know, in my area. Yeah, there were some private contractors too that yeah. were just amazing. Yeah. They, they, was they had some equipment yes, in that they, yeah. we weren't afraid to use it. <laughs> Seven days a week. Yeah, thanks. But, anyway. um, yeah, um, anyhow, I'm, um, I'm glad that you're where you are, you know, with this. Uh, you know, I think you'll doing a good job and you'll continue. Uh, thanks, and sure. We're sort of running out of time. Yeah. Um, but, um, we, uh, you know, we'll we'll do some more work on this, and you know, if we need, we'll invite you back to uh, to find out, uh, run across something that you think we'd be interested in. So, you know, you always give me a call or whatever. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Yeah. So we got to find out how we can get all of that 600 million people out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> I heard 15% of 600 million. Um, thanks again. Yep. Uh, Come on out. Good morning and welcome to the Ag Committee. Thank you. And we'll do a quick run around and introduce ourselves and, okay. uh, and uh, get right with it. Brian Collimore, okay. representing the Rutland District. And Reed Ryder, Senator for Chittenden North, who should put Starbucks. This is Hi. Brian Campion, the Senator from Bannington. I'm Rich Westman, the Senator from and I'm Bobby Sharp from Four Wings So again, uh, welcome. And uh, so Doug was saying that you kind of took his place uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, at current use uh, when he moved on to some other job. And, and uh, so, um, and of course, we have thousands of acres of farmland and Horse land and current use, and, and uh, wanted to invite you in to see how that was all going. And if you were still getting requests or, or not, and go from there. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I'm Jill Remick. I'm the director of property valuation and review at the tax department. And I did send, um, I have a PowerPoint, and I also have some. Um, I know we're trying to be good with paper, but we do have our PBR annual report. I brought you each copies of. It's just kind of a nice snapshot, not only for current use, but just property tax pieces in general. If you'd like one, if you won't, don't, I won't be offended. I'm going to take one and pass that. Um, and then I also brought along, this is also on our website, but this is the current use, um, the 2023 sort of summary of current use implications by town. Um, number of parcels, homestead, non-homestead, forest, agriculture, and old farm buildings, and so on. So uh, if you'd like to know those as well. So Linda, I think, do I open a Zoom, or should I? Do you mind? I could do it, or you can. Oh, okay, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. That, I'll be happy to let you okay. share the screen now. Sure, thank you. And tell me this is, if this is the right. The PowerPoint? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. All oh, right, so right, I um, I wanted I was asked to come in to give you folks sort of a current state of current use and just start from just really provide a little bit of the basics. A um, lot of information, obviously, about current use and anything you want to get in further depth. I would strongly suggest you talk with folks from agriculture and also forest parks recreation too, if you want to get into the forest because the vast majority of the the land is in forestry. 
Is that still the vast majority? Yeah, there's a table in here that breaks it out. I mean, it's probably 60% at least are in forest. Yeah. Um, we can keep getting more forest. <laughs> Great. So, so right, just to start from the beginning, just as a refresher, the current statutory purpose of the current use program, which has been in place since the 80s in some um, <coughs> form or another, is to um, encourage and assist the maintenance of Vermont's productive agriculture and forest land. So that's a, sort of a key component. This is this is for um, for productive agriculture and forest land use. Um, it's also to, to encourage and assist in the conservation for future use and also protecting natural ecological systems. Um, at the time, the language also addressed, and this is still what it says in statute, to um, prevent the accelerated conversion of the lands into um, more intense use, right? So um, rather than folks feeling like they have no choice um, because their property taxes are going up, but to sell off their land and piece of their parts, this can help retain those larger parcels of um, ag or forest land. Um, it's also designed to be more equitable for undeveloped land. Um, also, of course, to encourage Vermont's scenic natural resources. Once you have this job or in any way or involved with current use, you can't open it as you drive around the state and sort of picture the parcel map and go, oh, there, that's in current use. That's in current use. I don't know, please. Um, and then also, of course, to have Vermonters put plan for orderly growth. So, um, so that it's helpful to revisit the general purpose. So then, like I said, thanks. Linda. So the this I just grabbed the last couple of years just to show. Um, currently, there's about 19,600 parcels in the program. It takes up each year, but certainly it's sort of you know that trajectory is slowing as there's only so many acres that are eligible. Um, but it does make up over one third of Vermont's total acreage. Um, and as you can see, the number of parcels has has continued to go up. Um, the number of owners has ticked up slightly. Um, so there's about a little over 540,000 acres that are only agriculture, and then there's uh, a little over 2 million acres of forest. And keep in mind, a lot of qualified farmers can also have some land and forest as well. Yeah. Uh, do you think that um, that the the parcels have increased, but also the owners have increased? So mm -hmm. is is that because a big block of land, maybe the original dad and mom passed away, and the land had to get split up in the air. Do you see that happening? Yeah, I would say most of the processes we're doing are more transfers or partial transfers. Absolutely. Yep. Um, family members, uh, LLCs, you know, if a, if a farm is forming an LLC or forestry. So, yeah, it's, it's the same. A lot, a lot of the same acres, but getting sort of divvied up or shared differently. Yeah. Um, next. I have a few other background information about that in the breakup of the per person size. Um, be clear, it's only down. You know, and if I go back um, just 10 or 15 years ago, we saw a huge number of parcels being broke up to 27 acres um, to and keeping the land in current use, um, the 25, and they have a house lot at 20. And it's a lot of 100, 200 acre pieces. Do you have any um, um, background information um, for that? I think we have that data somewhere. I don't have it today, but yeah, and I think that might have slowed down somewhat because there's only so many ways you can split up pieces and parts. And just so folks are aware, the 27 acres is because you can have a two-acre house site and then 25 acres or more. So there, yes. there are a lot of those 27. Well, that um, you know, kind of quite a long period of time, and some of that was arrest. Yet kept pushing up because they appraised land in the first acre, so it push the cost of the program up dramatically. And um, so it would be interesting um, to get any information. Uh, that you, you look right at that, but <clears throat> in 21, which is the bottom line, yep. it's 547, and then you go up to 20 diagonally, yep. and then it drops to 543. Yep. But the yeah. number of parcels goes up. But the number of parcels is up. Yeah. You can see it right in that. Yeah. But what that does is because we appraise land 
first acre is the most expensive. If you had, um, if you have 120 acres and you break it up into four lots, you have four first acres now. So the whole thing's worth, uh, uh, cost more money in taxes and cost the program more money, but you're covering the same land and you probably have four houses. But you see, did you read the forest acres? Yep. The, that's gone up 30, 30,000. Yep. You're, you're, you're making, yep. So ag land going down and forest land going up. Yep. And it's smaller purses. And if, I did that little snapshot just to fit it on the on the slide, but on page 21 of that annual report, and it goes back to 2012, so you can see a, a larger, you know, we have data further back than that, of course, but yep. you, know, you know, the last 10 years or something like that. Yeah, I think we've kept every annual report since, I think, our earliest, like, 49, maybe. Look at the 2,000 parcel seaward. When you were here, when we did our current years, uh, at first, it was basically set up. Henry Cash set it up for portion. Mm -hmm. Then we, the Aggies got in. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we can we can always come back to this if we need to. I just want to make sure I get through these and answer any questions yeah. you have. So farm buildings is interesting. It has its own piece just because uh, an eligible farm building is actually taxed at zero percent value. So. Um, in 2023, those values ranged anywhere from a few hundred dollars to, you know, over seven million. You know, some of those like super industrial, maybe a sugaring operation or something like that. But they're those if they're eligible farm buildings that are part of the um, operations of the farm, then they can be um, enrolled in the program and can be taxed at zero value. Um, and there's, I think, in the annual report, there's also a breakdown of farm building data if you're looking for more. On that, and then, like I said, we do have it by value and number of parcels on that other sheet that I hand out. The farm buildings, uh, you have to be actively using that building to be able to call on. Yeah, it has to be part of the operations of the farm. Of that farm. Yeah. What about if you were? Um, you sold the cows, but you were using the barn uh, for drying cannabis in or mm -hmm. hemp in. That yep. would be an active yep. use. Still active. If it qualifies, you know, if there's other, if that cannabis operation is qualified for yeah, legal. Yeah. Yeah. So the example that uh, Belinda Hunt, who oversees this program for our team, gives me is, um, you know, if you're using it to store your paying equipment and things like that, that's fine. If you're using it to store an antique tractor that sits there for 10 years, that's not active at it, right? So as we know in Vermont, every season is short. Yeah. <laughs> so stuff might sit in there for a while, but as long as it's part of the um, the active use of that, um, of whatever's inside of it, it can be eligible. And then um, next slide. Um, the way that current use works is it, it adjusts the um, property tax bill for enrolled parcels. So when you enroll in the program, you get a contingent lien put on your on the enrolled portion of your parcel. Um, the lister or assessor in your town um, provides a value for both the enrolled and what's called the excluded. So right, that house site with two acres or uh, if you have other land adjacent that's not eligible to be in the program. Um, and then there are... Um, impacts both for the municipal taxation and the education fund. So um, the way the statute works is that every year the municipalities get what's called a hold harmless payment from the general fund that basically makes up the difference of what they were losing out on for municipal tax revenue for enrollment. Um, that way it's not um, incentivizing or disincentivizing municipalities to, um, to help us administer the program. They are going to be made whole. Um, they're not impacted by, by parcels getting the program or not. And then um, the education tax revenue um, is about $50 million in this most recent year, um, meaning that that was the tax savings to um, enroll the current use parcels yeah. in 2023. Do you have a slide in here of which towns got how much of that? Or? Yeah, I think that is one of the calls. Yeah, so that would be... In this table, which we also have this in Excel on our website if you want to just sort through and sift and, and cut through, but yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we walk it up right there. Yeah. And I think to Senator Weston's point, as with everything we have seen at the tax department about the COVID impact on their update, current use was not exempt from that either, right? There was a lot of property changing hands, a lot of property changing hands for higher value. Um, if you do break up a parcel, the lister is required to value um, a house site if that's appropriate. And so that would be a higher value. So you do see that overall value of the um, enrollment increasing over these past few years yeah. in part on par with everything else we're seeing with the transfer tax returns and the grain list. So is that is that a total payout of 70 uh, 69 million? Right. So the the it is 69 million dollars in total tax savings to landowners. Right. So the the 50 million of um, non-collected education tax is just simply not collected. It's not collected revenue. Whereas the municipal savings, the general fund actually pays that out to the municipalities. Yeah. Uh, right, we can go to the next if you'd like. Okay. Did have another slide in here, please. Um, all right, and this was the piece we were just discussing, right? So. Um, and you can see it changed somewhat each year. Those asterisks just mean that we updated those numbers from prior years. But um, so there's the municipal savings of enrollment, and that's what our whole harmless payment is that we send out to the towns every year. There's the education tax savings to enroll landowners. Um, and then there's just that the total of those two pieces. So it's it's ticking up. It's not extreme, but obviously the value of property has been going up. Um, and that, that shows up in the land use change tax as well. And again, we have this table in the, in the annual report too. See, we, we all, we usually all just go to our town meetings or city meetings. We hardly ever get any thank yous for the positive thing. <laughs> that $70 million up there. Yeah. Um, never hear a word about that. <laughs> you know, it helped the whole community. Absolutely. And actually, those dollars, if they aren't paid out, are actually spent within the community right. uh, for economic business. And, and uh, yeah, we don't, we don't hear much about that. <laughs> Uh, let's see, and I did want to just walk through, it's it's complicated to administer current use because it involves landowners, um, involves real estate attorneys in a lot of instances, any forest land, they often have a consulting forester to help them with their forest management plan. Um, they do have to uh, follow a forest management plan that is approved and monitored by Forest Parks and Recreation. So any parcel that is coming through our hand for approval or transfer, things like that, that has any forest land associated with it goes also through forest parks and recreations, county foresters, and they actually review those and approve them and let us know when they're ready. Um, we also do have a small but mighty team of folks at the tax department at PBR um, that are processing applications, processing transfers, checking um, various eligibility, looking at maps. Um, there's a lot of components to um, processing these. There also is a current use advisory board that is the statutory board. Um, I'm one of the positions that's on that board. It's also made up of folks from agriculture, forest parks and recreation, um, appointees such as a uh, municipal official, uh, uh, agriculture representative, forest representative, and so on. So that it's like it's a good mix of folks, and they actually set the use values, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, the listers and assessors play a huge role in this as well because they have to value each of those individual pieces. They have to double check their grant list and make sure that the acreage that we have for that parcel lines up with their grant list. Um, if there are any other de deeds or leave, um, liens or anything else on the property. And then once we have approved an application and an entity or a parcel is enrolled in the program, there's a contingent lien that goes into the land records. Um, so town clerks also have to work for that into the land records. The idea being that if at any point it comes out of the program, it's not eligible for enrollment anymore, then a land use change tax is set at that time. And if you want the lien removed, you pay the land use change tax. Uh, that also, and I have a thing, I have a couple slides on that as well. That's also if it's developed or no longer eligible. Um, we do have a lot of transfers where maybe 
one larger piece remaining is still eligible, but then the piece that came out is now too small to be enrolled or otherwise not eligible, or the individual who owns it is not a qualified farmer. So then those folks would pay that land exchange tax to have the lien removed. So a lot of logistics involved with. Yeah, if, if, uh, if a landowner applies for current use uh, ag land today, do they have to have a contract with somebody to keep that active and in use or how, how does that work? Yeah, so they either have to be a qualified farmer, which there's a few different ways that can happen, or they can be leasing, um, have some sort of a lease with a qualified farmer. Um, yeah, there's also an income-based requirement um, that, you know, if you are generating at least 50% of your income from the business of farming, that's one of the ways you can be a qualified farmer. Um, so we do actually collect all those leases, too, and keep track of the dates. Some of them are 100-year leases, and, you know, we don't have to say worry about that. Some of them are for a dollar. But they do need to be either used by or at least to qualify farmer in order to be able to farm. How do you qualify? What's that? Do you qualify through leases? Well, that gets in to a whole problem that going forward that I I don't think the tax department or anybody has talked about. Um, I had leases. And um, the organic firm that I had with the lease, they went out of farming in June. And I'm required to have a lease on the agricultural land, land for at least three three the last five, five years. years. And the, the problem, problem now, now is, is um, the, the nearest farm milking for me is. Um, it is, is at least 15, 15 miles, miles away. 15? Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the question, question is, is how, how do I mean that, that, that I'm being in peace with an active farm on that, that land? And I'm now scrambling to figure out how, how I can keep, keep the land in use. current use. I live in the valley that I grew up. up. There were over 20, 20 farms in the valley. Yeah. And, and as you see, the big can come. Uh, the, the shrinking, shrinking of, of the number of arms, arms it's, it's harder to get, get leases to, to do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, well yeah, yeah uh, but, but, I, but I, do think, think, I, I do think, think that, that it, it is, is an issue, issue for many, many people. Oh. You, know, you know, we've gone, gone from how many, many dairy farms, farms in the state, state down, down to less, less than 500, 500 in a fairly short period of time. Well, the small ones, yeah, the, the real, real deal, deal is, here is the small ones are the ones, ones we really, really care about. about. Uh, you know, you know the, the big guys will look out for themselves, themselves. The, the small farms, the people are getting older, and, and it's sad, sad to see the all so long because you know who I am. See, the big farms, which is fine. Or, or somebody, somebody from, from down, down country, country that wants to uh, have a weekend, weekend or summer, summer place. place. Uh, yeah, yeah, and a lot, a lot of folks in Isolation Ventures have said another way, which is that, that at least our $2,000, I think, is from the sale of some sort of product. Um, that that sense that that's another way that we folks have had that um, mm -hmm. been in the program. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, and, and, and in income one is tough, too, because a lot of families may be farming their things. Um, body, body of work, work but, but maybe one, one of them has, has a job, job in the state, state or something like that. Yeah, and a lot of young yeah. couples, one yeah. works off the farm room, and then one yeah. works yeah. hand. Yeah. But, but to reduce that 50% percent number, it's a high bar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you got to put a pause in there. there. That is as long as the one, one that, that works off the farm room. Incorporate their income, income into the farm account to keep the farm going. They should still qualify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 it's not, it's not meaning to catch, catch them, but it's, it's, it's an unfortunate or hurdle for some folks that are trying to so keep our farm operating. We've had a lot of farm operations over the years, years so I say the life of this school teacher. They bring the money home, home. home. he can get the farm going. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of done. Even though, you know, I mean, they had to do that, that to keep the farm going. あ、ちょっと、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
I don't mean to be, but. Yeah, 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 that, uh, that, that, that
I think so. so. Yeah, yeah, they get, they a, get lot a lot of data from like USDA yeah, yeah, too, 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 with that. that, that um, and so, and so then for the 2024 year, for those use values, values, those, those are the, um, those, those pieces, pieces that we'll be sending to the list of assessors. That's what the folks are going to be our contact tax based on for enrolled acres. Um, I can I quickly go through these next, next few, right? right. I, I, think I think this, this committee, committee is probably a little better, better versus than our average Joe, Joe, but you know, you know some, some of the, um, the reasons, reasons for enrolling, enrolling right, is that you would see a pretty significant, significant property tax savings, savings. Um, uh, on, on, on in, in that that enrolled acres. That's, that's just an example to show that. that. So then, then the next slide, slide is kind of why we would want to, right? right? So the contingency lien, once that's on, that goes with the land. So, so until, until it's developed and the land use change tax is paid, until, until it's uh, uh, no more eligible, eligible, maybe there was a contrary that the Forest Park Conservation identified, um, or, or you want the land removed, um, um, then that, that lien remains on land. land. Um, um, there's, there's definitely a cost to bring out the application materials, the maps, the forest management plans. Uh, I, like I like to think for the agriculture, agriculture it's not quite, quite as expensive, but you still need help with like the mapping and the paperwork and things like that. I think the application fee, including, including the reporting fee that goes to the town clerk, is, is, um, is $90. Um, again, like, like I mentioned earlier, if your property, property, value, value, property value, value is low, low or, or you know, for whatever, whatever reason, reason, then you wouldn't necessarily have more time to enroll in the program and not have that money on the land. Um, and, and the land use change tax can't, can't work off actually made it as far as, far as the city and not. We, the land use change, change tax is pretty difficult for um, to administer and also for property owners to understand. understand. You, don't you don't know, know what, what that penalty, penalty will be until, until you make that, that commitment to remove the lien. So, so um, because, because it's, it's basically the way the, way the statute works right now is the land use change tax is um, requires the lister or assessor to value that acreage or turn out as a standalone parcel. And then, and then the land use change tax is 10% of that. So, 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 so it can be very unpredictable. You can kind of feel there's, there's a appeal process. But, um, so, so if you're considering going into the program, but you think you might want to take it out in eight, eight or 10 years, years you, don't you don't really have, have a sense of what that land use change tax penalty would be. Can you move the, um, yeah, yeah, usually, yeah, uh, two acres extracted for, 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 can you, can you move that, that two acres, acres uh, you know, um, because of a different, different spot on the property? Right. right. Possibly. I know, I know a couple of years ago that the statute changed, changed so you could have more than, than one, one dwelling within, within a two acre site, site for example, so folks sort of move around where that, that is. Um, but, but I think it, it might depend, depend on the situation. situation. You know, you know if it's moving from, from one, one um, category, category into a rural land. So what I'm thinking is <coughs> you have the wrong to get, get to the woods. So, so once you get, get, get to the woods, woods you know, and then you have just the wood road, road. Uh, you, you, you decide, decide to take, to take that, that wood road, road and you may make it longer in into the, the, the woods. woods. So, so in, in you wind your, your Two acres, you know, up, up into the woods, woods further. If you can move it from, from the edge of the woods, woods to, to the, the new spot, up in the woods, to be more secluded, or whatever reason you decide to do something. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, the ability to be probably a new map showing show what the excluded acreage is, is. Yeah. and, and um, um, and the list would have to set whatever that value that that house is. That's what I guess. guess. Um, there's, there's a summary on the next two, two pages, pages of just some, some of the enrollment. There's, there's a lot to it. To it. Um, um, a lot of this is mapped out, out in the statute um, about, about what can qualify as forced enrollment. Um, um, and then and last year, the legislature did add to um, a, a possible that that reserve or land. land. Um, um, that's a new new category now. So, so this, this will be the first year of us actually seeing applications that have reserved forest land. land. It's, it's very, very like, like intricate uh, qualifications and measurement, measurement of what, what qualifies for that. that and I would definitely prefer to have the It's, it's you know, percentages, percentages of census areas, percentages of proportionate to the overall weight acreage, and so on. on. Um, <coughs> that, that should change last year. But, but do they? Yeah, these forever ones are. They must have to get out of the current use, right? 
Well, I think the theory is they can stay in, they still would have to have a forest management plan. It would be assessed as if it was for forest land. That, that was the change last year, year as much as I said, I definitely want that PR but that, that's... <laughs> and then one yeah, piece of... It is, it's just how you people that have gone by 58 years and grow old trees, and then, and then we're not having to pay the tax on it, and, and you know, know when, when the tree, tree it gets to the end, end of its life. life. I mean, it's, it's like, like us, you know, we all like. And, 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 and uh, you have to manage your forest like anything else if you want to help you make your forest. That's not a good deal. Yeah. 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 But anyway. anyway, so the last bullet on there that's helpful for this committee is just if an owner is a qualified farmer, then they can have unlimited non productive forest land or up to 25 acres of productive forest in full. Um, so, ag land and buildings, right? There's again, it's pretty clearly spelled out in statute, and we have a combination of the statutory language, the administrative rules from the current supervisory board, and then like Supreme Court or hearing officer decisions. But in general, it's active agriculture use. So um, pasturing livestock, growing some sort of crop or hay, apple orchards, um, maple products, things like that, that you're producing something from that. So um, not to go down the rabbit hole of horses, but if you're pasturing horses and you're um, raising horses to sell horses, you're breeding horses to sell horses, that's active. If I'm boarding my horse on Town Hill Road, for him to, you know, that's boarding and I'm not, it's not active agriculture. <laughs> I ask if we, this is a, a question that we face. If we sell hay out of horses to people in Southern New England, is that agriculture? If you're a Vermont farmer that's producing that hay and selling if it? We're, um, if I take um, 50 acre meadow and we're um, not doing other things, but we're doing that in some way. Is that agriculture of selling hay to um, someone in, in Southern New England? Sure, it's like growing strawberries. If as long as you generate two grand, I think that's it's right. in your hand. So that's the threshold for, if you make at least $2,000 from the sale of that crop, then that would qualify. I don't know if you would. I don't know what pays on well, um, um, it, you know, um, but the reason you would take it to Southern New England or take it to Saratoga are those, um, you go from four or five dollars a bale to fifteen. Yeah. Um, I've been told yes. that that's not agricultural dealing with hmm. horse people. Well, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm asking. Yeah, I shouldn't the have mentioned horse. <laughs> but, you know, but horse. I think horses were considered a different category, but I'm not sure, you know. Right, I think you can sell your crop to whomever, wherever you want, as long as you can demonstrate on your, um, on your tax, okay. you've earned at least the $2,000. Uh, let's see, how many went? Yeah, oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. just about out of time. Okay, so development, like I was saying, I think we sort of covered this, right? And development is um, triggered by a few different ways, uh, carving out a house site, um, if you create a parcel less than 25 acres, um, right, and again, there is this sort of exception. Um, the cut contrary, so this is if the Forest Parks and Recreation, when, as part of the Forest Management Plan, they do a they do a spot check, they find a cut contrary. I think there's an example of this I just saw this morning in Digger about um, a, a, a forest land that had a cut contrary because the person they hired was not exactly the most up and up forester. Um, if you construct any building, road, or anything like that that's not related to the farming, logging, or forestry. So the example I always think of is, you know, we found one that was like, it was a bike, a bike dirt track. That's not part of the farming or the logging. But if you're using, if you're creating a new trail to reach a new field or a new trail to reach a different, um, different stand, you're good. Um, also, the agriculture um, enrollment has to meet um, the uh, agriculture's uh, 
water quality. They'll let us know if there's a violation of that. And a lot of times we'll try to work with, and I think uh, Agency of Agriculture does as well, sort of try to work with folks to, to mitigate that so it doesn't come to the point of actually being removed from the program. All right, sorry, I'm rushing. There's so much to this, but like I said, I'm happy to come back. This is all on our site. Um, so the land use change tax, I think we've kind of already talked about that, right? That's that That's that standalone. Um, if you develop it or if you want the lien removed, you've got to pay the land use change tax. It's set as a standalone parcel by the municipality, and it's then 10% of that valuation. Um, and the way that we did that, we collect that land use change tax from the taxpayer, and then we send back to the municipality up to $2,000 of whatever we've collected. Um, and then there's just a table on the next slide that's just sort of giving you some sense. And land use change tax is a little different, right? It's it's not predictable. It's not necessarily linear because different years, different parcels might come out, different parcels might come out that are a different value. So it's not necessarily going to look the same every year. Um, but that sort of shows that trend over time of buildings coming out, acres coming out, or um, and then the number of total withdrawals. I think that's pretty much it. I just, I, I did want to let folks know, especially if any of you have, we are working towards modernizing our um, processes. We still very much are using paper maps and scanning in applications. Um, and so we have two huge file rooms of paper maps that go back to late 70s and 80s, um, some which are kind of disintegrating. So um, we are going to be moving our all that we're going to digitize that's part of a larger effort in the tax department, um, which could also cut back on some of the costs because right now we actually require applicants to submit three co three paper copies of the maps because one goes to the local officials for the land records, one is in our files, and one goes to Forest Parks and Recreation. So that's expensive when you're some of these maps are massive and expensive. Um, that's all I have for my PowerPoint, but I'm happy to take any questions or come back another time. Yeah, well, I, or maybe I you're situated. We, um, you know, we may have you back when we get some house bills over here. Okay. And, uh, but really want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate all the yeah. you know, yeah. all that. Thanks. And uh, so thank, thank you. Nice to meet you. So, committee, uh, we have uh, Jason Marlins, is it? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, grab a seat, David, Jason. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I realize time is valuable and uh, well, I appreciate it. Yeah, right through, and uh, Irene brought us some material, I believe. Uh, few weeks ago in regards to your situation in Essex and yeah. uh, there's been discussion in both directions in regards to it, um, whether it should be allowed or not allowed and uh, and we just um, felt that you know, it would be great to hear from you and and I don't are you is Jason a constituent of yours, just a close neighbor or something? Uh, Relatively close. Yeah. yeah. He's in Essex County. So we thought we would have you in and talk Thank about you. The, the whole issue. Well, yeah, I, I was concerned because the grossly erroneous information that Legislative Council, you know, presented to you and, you know, what kind of conceptions you guys reached because of it. So I'm here to... Uh, address those, answer any questions, clear any misconceptions, and, uh, you know, let the discussion on the table. So, um, the first thing he said is I have a hundred ducks, and that isn't even close to the truth. Uh, I currently have 26 adults that are used for breeding and egg production purposes. Now, uh, part of my business model is selling live birds and eggs. And uh, I have an incubator with a capacity of 50. So that means when a clutch hatches, my numbers will vary considerably. However, that doesn't mean that uh, the population is going to maintain 
those numbers, uh, you know, they're ducklings and juveniles that uh, are, are for sale. Or to be so you average roughly 26. At the moment, right. only six. Yes. And uh, yeah, we were, I don't know, whoever testified to that. And they were the state council, Michael Grady. Yeah, but they get their information from, you know, it could be incubator ducks, uh, baby ducks, and big ducks. And, well, at the point if I had 100, or even anywhere close to it. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm confused as to why you were even discussing not allowing small farming. I mean, this very building, uh, there's a statue that sits at the top of it, that's Ceres, the Roman goddess of agriculture. That's because uh, agriculture is a foundation of Vermont and it's a part of our identity and culture. I think it should be encouraged, not uh, farmers shouldn't be uh, demonized and operations shouldn't be vilified. And part of our goal was to you know, to protect and enhance small farms. But when you get down under an acre, an acre or so, well, that's kind of a real, real small farm. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's like in a, especially in an area where there's a residence, uh, you know, not that far away. Sure. So there's two sides to that story. Whether yeah. well, uh, the Essex Junction, as you know, uh, the representative I mentioned, uh, is small. It's 4.6 square miles. There is an agricultural district which lies directly next to a densely populated residential area. And not only that, but <laughs> the city has a deal with the Whitcomb Farm to to uh, spread tons of human biomass on those fields next to a densely populated residential area. So they're saying that one area of the same city is okay for that, but not for me to spread some duck manure on my yard. Are well, you uh, in the agricultural district? I'm in the residential district. But like, as I said, the agricultural district that, district that exists in Essex Junction is adjacent to a very densely populated residential area. Yeah. <clears throat> if you were, I would assume that if you were in the agricultural district of your community, they wouldn't even be a concern. Yeah, well, I mean, in the history of Vermont, there's only been one municipality to challenge whether uh, farming is regulated by the state or at a municipal level. And that's Essex Junction. That's why we're here today. <laughs> are they, as a town? Uh, well, this all came about because of one neighbor's complaints. To the town. To the town, to the city. Um, uh, there is a long, well-documented history of these people, Sharon and Pete Padnos, filing a number of different complaints for a number of different things in terms of my operation, um, from noise, uh, campfires, and uh, smell, but at no point have I been issued a single citation. I have a four-year request I can show you right now where, um, uh, where the Padnos has called the fire department and the police, alleging that burning marijuana smoke was entering their home. So on the sixth of fifth uh, of June, twenty twenty-two, at approximately eleven thirty hours, I was dispatched. This is the uh, officer's report. I was dispatched to the Eight Tap Street location residence for burning marijuana, and the smell was going into the residence of Six Tap Street. Upon arrival, I cannot smell cannabis in the area, nor see smoke. I attempted to knock on the front door twice, no answer. I continued to 6 Taft Street, spoke with the residents who stated that the mail was in the backyard and they allowed me to walk onto the lawn to get uh, to the gate of 8 Taft Street. I was able to make contact with the resident of 8 Taft Street, who appeared to be burning a small brush fire. 
in the backyard. Uh, so in speaking with Mr. Struthers, I informed that that's Essex Junction Ordinance. Um, the only thing I was in violation of was my fire was on the ground instead of on a uh, approved structure. So, you know, either of these people can differentiate between a normal campfire and a pile of burning marijuana, or they provided false information to the police with malice. And one thing to know is <laughs> June 5th of 2022 was before I had a harvest of cannabis, dog use cannabis. So how can I burn a pile of marijuana that doesn't exist? It, what about hemp? Did you grow hemp? I grew hemp in 2020 and 2021, yes. You could have been burning some hemp, right? I was not. <laughs> Nor did the officer notice any smell of the sword in this police report. And this this is the, not only the first time this happened, this happened the second time in 2023, and the exact same thing happened. The, the fire department brought the ordinance to the Padmos. They explained to them that I wasn't doing anything wrong, and I certainly wasn't burning any marijuana. And how far is that neighbor from? Adjacent. Well, right next to next, you? Yes. That, uh, yeah, because those, I don't know, I saw the map of, of the uh, health and things. You aren't yeah. too far. Well, uh, and I, I may be a small plot of half an acre, but I attest that, you know, not only does do I fit the, but it's, it's appropriate. I have plenty of land for both my cannabis and my ducks. And small farming should be encouraged, not vilified. How many acres? 0 0.54. 0 0.54. So, I mean, I know, I know how big an acre is. And a half acre, in the house on it, in the driveway. And I don't know if you have any outer building. Uh, you've got a, a shed to keep the lawn. Have a barn. Yeah. Um, there's not a whole lot of property left there. Well, it's very subjective. I find there's plenty. I could even expand a substantial amount. So you don't do many plants and... What kind of plants? I have, last year I had a, over 150 tomato plants. Well, tomato, I mean... Can I am cannabis, I'm allowed up to 125. On that property? On that property. Be kind of crowded, wouldn't it? Not in my opinion. I have plenty of room for expansion. I could, have, and well, so in 2020 and 2021, I had 250 hemp plants. Now, hemp has a higher terpene content than adult use cannabis or THC bearing cannabis, which means it's far more smelly. Now, I had double the capacity of my adult use license. And no complaints were lodged, not a single one with the AAF anywhere. So this is more of a discrimination against THC bearing cannabis, reefer madness, and uh, a taboo against a, a plant that is not only regulated, but uh, allowed by every home in Vermont to grow. Yeah, yeah. whatever it is, I don't know what the... Uh, I, I think you know what the uh, specifications are for my commercial operation, but three in, inside. Well, you can make a substantial amount of smell with three plants, especially if everybody has it. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a little history or whatever. You lived here before you began to grow cannabis. Yes, sir. My family's on this property for 42 years. Okay. And not to on neighbors or anything, but there was no conflict before this. Everybody was kind of getting along in the neighborhood. Not until I started growing the Duckies campus. Okay. So you, you feel strong that what triggered the... Absolutely. Complaints. I mean, there's been no complaints about my hemp. In fact, the neighbors were asking me for some. And I don't know much about that industry, but it seems like it kind of smells the same. It smells more. 
I would argue, has a higher terpene content, and that's what the molecules that cause smell, smell and taste. So it wasn't the ducks they were objecting to, it was the... Yeah, well, well, I mean, the original complaint was odor, and what it was actually was that I had a compost bin in between our houses, and admittedly it was smelly, and I addressed that, and when I brought that up, along with a number of other um, ways that I've been mitigating their numerous complaints, they said that they can still smell hay, and that they don't, and they stated on public record that they don't mind farming, they just don't want to see it here. So it's a not in my backyard, quite literally, situation. But what about my backyard? Am I not allowed to do what I see fit and grow my own food and, uh, you know, offer organic produce, fruits, vegetables, and eggs to the community? So do you have a fence between the two properties? My entire property is fenced in, sir. Solid fence, or well, chain link, black chain link fence on on three sides, and I had to uh, change the fencing on one side, but so it's it's not it's a just a post and wire, but that can certainly yeah. easily be remedied. I, mean, I didn't know if you had a solid fence. No, you know, no. then the smell might go up over it. But, well, you know, and uh, have any of the neighbors come to me at, at any point, no neighbor, no member of the municipality or, or otherwise has come to me ever and said, we have a problem with what you're doing. Is there anything we can do about it? Can we mitigate this? Can we, is there any anything we can do? Nothing. I just get um, notice from the city in the mail saying that I need to cease operations. So they they have sent you a cease and desist. Well, uh, yeah, they said that my ducks were out of uh, specification with the land development code. I said that I'm an agricultural process, and Section 1702 of the Municipal Code clearly says that all agricultural processes are exempt. And they said, well, um, we don't think what you're doing is agriculture. So I gave them the definition definition of agriculture. The city replied and said, well, you need to be a farm. Okay, so I contacted the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Farm and Markets, and I went through the process and got, and May 5th of 2023, excuse me, May 4th, I got official status as a farm because I produce and sell fruits, vegetables, and eggs and like purpose, livestock. Uh, so what are you hoping, uh, your goal of being here today, some background on all on this, which is certainly helpful. Hmm. Who are your senators? So I, you know, with, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but my representative uh, is Lori Halpin and Karen Dolan. Okay. They both okay. introduced uh, legislation that I'm going to provide testimony until okay. to try to stop my farming operations. So your hope in the legislature is to do what over the next couple of days? Stop H549. Stop H549. Well, do you mind reminding me what's 549? It is the regulation of outdoor campus. Got it. Okay. So my concern is that Representative Houghton presented the bill as only commercial, but as it reads, it is all outdoor cannabis cultivation, which would affect home growing. So this is going to affect not only every cannabis business in the entire state, but every single person who wants to cultivate cannabis. And so, I mean, there's two very separate issues being conflated here, my ducks and my cannabis. So I'm here to provide information on both. But if there's only 20, you pasture, I assume, yeah. the 26 adult ducks right. on the same property as you plant your Cannabis on yes, sir. in the summer. Yes. And what happens to the 26 adult ducks once you plant your cannabis? They continue to produce eggs and. No, but in the same uh, plot? Yes, sir. So you don't have to have like a a different pasture for or area for the duck? No, sir. I, there are 
of pasture raised that they are free to roam within the fence there. Such it's one way of doing it. Well, I mean, uh, in August of 2011, I sustained a uh, uh, first fracture and, and my thoracic spine. And, uh, yeah. Miracles of modern science were able to give me a titanium vertebrae and stabilize my spinal cord injury. Um, part of my recovery process was growing organic produce and cannabis as medicine. So I've been growing cannabis on this land since, I think, 2015. That's when I got my medical marijuana card. Never complaint Zero. And then 250 plants, giant hemp plants in my backyard. Not a single complaint. But the second that it became adult use, THC bearing cannabis, it became a huge deal. Yeah, that's strange. And it was the same neighbors. Correct. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, but we, you know, we have had other complaints from other people, um, small farm cannabis, uh, the older. Okay. Uh, you know, not, not your, but another post, uh, but that's gone on, you know, neighbors complaining about neighbors from manure spreading to, you know, cows roaming loose or heifers to, to the odors. To, I mean, it's gone on forever, but um, so did you, did you grow product on the, on your plot before you say, 15, 2015? Yes, sir. Did you, did you used to add crops prior to that? Absolutely. Massive amounts of crops. I try to grow as much of my own food as possible. Yeah. So it isn't that you changed use of that land. Then. No, sir. Other questions for Jason? No, thank you. Uh, is there anyone who wants to answer Brian's question? That's the Chipman Central District. So that would be um, for Tim Chalk and Bill. Oh, okay. Thank you. For Senator Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, I have zero representation. I'm a single disabled person up against uh, an entire municipality, both risk representatives in my district, and now the uh, introduction of possibly new legislation. Well, appreciate it. Yeah. We only do kind of bills that get that. So it, it takes uh, a lot of work to pass bills. It takes a long time. I, I don't know the house, how they're progressing with that, what committee it's in. H450 or 549 must be an act. Uh, it's in um, the uh, Committee of uh, Government Operations and Military Affairs. Really? <laughs> it, was, it was introduced into Environment and Energy, and I don't know why it got say, transferred. I don't know if it's because they didn't get traction or if they, you know, where cannabis is, you know, government ops. You see, that bill would have been introduced last year, I believe. Well, that's a good question. They have, they have a little time this year to put some things in. January 3rd, according to the... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Dick. And it was the Amy Sheldon of Millbury moved that her committee be relieved of it, sent over to the I would expect, though, that's going to end up in the Yeah. I would expect it has traction. I would hope it doesn't. Uh, well, it doesn't always get moved because of crack. This jurisdiction, and I would, I don't know, I have read the bill, so I don't know if it's ag or if it's uh, building office, but 
Uh, anything else from any anything? I just want to reiterate that you know I understand that you, you know, everybody has concerns about farming in, in a residential area and the impacts it has on neighbors, but again, the agricultural district that is in Essex Junction is directly adjacent to a very densely populated residential area. So I'm not doing anything out of what the city's already classified as located. Set for a year and not in the ag district. I am in the R1 district, yes. That and that is being that is being, issue. that is being challenged actually in Vermont Superior Court. Yeah, that you know, if you were sitting in the corner of the agricultural district, I don't think there'd be a hill of beans worth of validity. Yes, sir. But where do you draw the line? If I'm, if I'm going to move my operation somewhere else, I'm going to face the exact same opposition. I could be hundreds of feet away from uh, a neighbor and I could still be get complaints. So how far is far enough and where's the line drawn? Well, you know, if you're in an ag district, they can put up all the red flags they want and mm -hmm. holler as loud as they want and tough luck, but you're stuck in a residential district and you're well, trying to change the, the use of it from re strictly residential to some other form of use. You know, they do have a like to stand on. I mean, I was on the zoning board back home for years and years and, and yeah. We had farmland, but we lived near JP mm -hmm. in the ski area. So it was, it was hard to change that from strictly ag to ag business, you know, ag and commercial. Uh, but uh, because that, if you own just ag land and you're on the road to JP, um, and somebody comes along and wants to buy a corner lot to put a motel on or a hotel on that zones strictly ag or SOL. If you, if you, you know, sorry, that zoning means quite a bit if you sure. got it zoned. Ag or zone residential or zone commercial. Um, the state law specifically says that municipalities may not regulate farming. Yeah, but they regulate zoning, mm -hmm. and that must be what they're after you on is you're trying to farm in a residential area in. Oh, it's the ducks. It's not my farm. It's not the production of tomatoes or cucumbers. It's the ducks. So I'm trying to think of a way to get around it. If maybe if you, I would love to buy some land in the agricultural district, but the all there's one lot for sale, and the overwhelming amount of land is owned by one farm. And again, it's right next to a densely populated residential area, so I'm going to be facing the exact same problems. Yeah. Well, um, if we should happen to get that bill from the help, um, you know, we'll we'll certainly notify you and and uh, invite you in again. I appreciate that. Um, but I guess the only thing we can do is wish you well. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Well, about appreciate you coming. Thank you. Yeah, you know, coming in too. To yeah, me. thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. It's yeah, you know, you're here. You hear all here, so we wanted to certainly hear your, you know, your side of the ovation. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Should we go outside? Bye. Uh, yeah. We're oh, we're right on time today.